My name is Graeme Campbell and I'm, and I'm the Senior Beef and Sheep Technologist here at Caffrey. You're very welcome to the fourth uh, Northern Ireland Sheep Programme WebEx event. As stated previously, it was our intention to hold these events out on farms, but sadly, due to the current pandemic, uh, that just can't happen. In the event of technology letting us down tonight, please note this event will be recorded and the link to the recording can be emailed to you in due course. Please note that through, throughout tonight's event, you may experience some connection problems from time to time due to your broadband speed. If this happens, just hold on and uh, it will pick up again. You will have the opportunity throughout the event to submit questions. Laptop users can submit questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Mobile phone users can access the Q&A option via the three dot icon, which appears when you tap your mobile screen. We will try and answer a number of these at the end of the event. In addition to this, we would like your feedback in relation to how you the event went. A short survey will be available at the end and I will give you more details uh, at the very end of the event. Tonight, I'd like to welcome our four panel speakers. Our first speaker is Senan White. Uh, Senan is a Caffrey Beef and Sheep Advisor and is the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme Manager. Darren Carty uh, is a livestock specialist with the Irish Farmers Journal. Darren will be joining us, joining us for the question and answer session. Peter and Carl McCalkin from Ballycastle uh, are the Northern Ireland Sheep Programme participant hosts for tonight. And Patrick Grant, uh, the sheep vet. Patrick uh, the sheep, set up the sheep vet company a short time ago, and it's a highly specialised sheep health and advanced fertility veterinary service uh, set up by Patrick. So each and every one of you are very welcome tonight. And you will also see uh, we have Pamela with us. Pamela is from the IT team uh, who's there to support, to provide any technical support if something goes wrong. Just a very brief re recap on the first events. Uh, this is our fourth event. Event one focused on grassland management. Uh, that was in uh, early July. Event two focused on finishing lambs and meeting market specifications and concluded with a detailed presentation in relation to future markets by Philly Manil from the Irish Farmers Journal. Event three, which took place at the end of August, focused on breeding for performance, and we looked at assessing you and rams pre-breeding. And again, as I said earlier, there are recordings for each of these events. And if you haven't got them or want them, just send me an email and I can circulate them through to you. In relation to tonight's event, we're once again going to provide a brief background to the program as we're conscious that there's a number of new people logged in tonight. Uh, Peter and Carl McCacken are upland hill farmers from Ballycastle in County Antrim. Tonight, the brothers will provide us with a background to their sheep enterprise and will highlight some of the changes they hope to make to their enterprise uh, within the coming years. The brothers commenced OPA skinning uh, on their flock in 2019. At that time, it came, became very apparent that OPA was a major issue within the flock and a culling policy was soon put into place. Patrick scanned the flock again in mid-August 2020 on probably one of the most on one of the worst days of the year as Storm Francis was very much in control. But on a positive note, the 2020 results showed a 50% reduction in OPA within the flock. And this really highlighted the importance of culling. Once uh, Carl uh, finishes, Carl and Peter finishes, Patrick will provide a background to OPA and will highlight the importance of testing. In June 2019, myself and Patrick held a very successful practical OPA scanning event at Greenmount Hill Farm. This event provided farmers with an opportunity to see the scanning process uh, in action. It was our intention to run a similar type of event on one of the, the sheep programme farms this year, but again, due to the COVID pandemic, this uh, can't happen. So, uh, as I said, Darren is also available to answer any questions in relation to the programme uh, as one of the project partners. So, at this stage, I'm now going to hand over to Senan, Peter and Carl and Patrick, and thanks uh, to all of you for giving up your time tonight. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Graham. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, and um, welcome everybody to this evening, and I hope you're all uh, safe and well. Um, I say just a brief background, folks, uh, the agenda, and we'll go briefly through the programme here. So, what we have here is the programme background, as you know from previous. It is a partnership, um, collaborative partnership between ourselves, uh, Caffrey, the Dumbia, part of the Don Meats Group, and the Irish Farmers Journal. Um, the programme objective, as I say, is a three-year programme which we want to be able to demonstrate you know, how farm income can be increased through adopting the best management practices that we have 
and adopting uh, and using sorry, the latest latest technologies available. So we'll have the 10 programme Farmers there, and I say that was on a visit to uh, Dundee Abattoir last August. So the farmers are split uh, equally between upland and lowland. Um, we have Clement there on the left that we spoke to last week, or so the last version, uh, with Peter and Carl up in the top right, who are, who are our hosts for tonight. And then with the lowland farmers um, who we spoke to, uh, Porig, uh, middle right, and Mark, uh, top right, who we spoke to in the previous occasions. The program itself has ten overall, or sorry, eight overall focus areas. Uh, we've already covered um, points five, six, and seven: a uh, performance to graze grass, improving a uh, breeding profitable sheep, marketing prowess, and tonight we're going to focus on point three: flock health uh, optimization. Uh, with featuring uh, Peter and Carl, so that's that's where we're at tonight. So basically, say what what does that mean? Well, very basically, flock health is a foundation of which production will prosper or fail. The bottom line, if, you're if you haven't got a healthy flock, you're not going to make money. That's as simple as that there. So a big part of that, and it's something we've done with all the, the participants, is having a health plan. Um, however, having a health plan won't change everything overnight. Um, but what it will do, um, if it's done well and kept up to date, is it'll highlight some of the high-risk areas on the farm. And some of those that we're obviously highlighting is antibiotic use, uh, increasing the role of vaccinations, antimalic resistance, which is becoming a big problem. Looking at normal things like nameless, but what we're focusing on tonight is emerging diseases or these iceberg diseases, and the one in particular case is OPA, or, um, so that's what we'll be talking about tonight. But the bottom line in the red there, Overall, we want aim to reduce antibiotic use, we want to decrease mortality, and we want to increase yo and lamb performance. So that's what we're trying to do overall uh, this evening, and especially focusing on the OPA. So say each farm, again, just to reiterate, we have farm goals that we sat down with each farm uh, at the start of the programme. And again, folks, I would encourage every farm business to sit down at some stage during the year and plan ahead of what things you need to look at uh, with your and especially those in the business development groups, you know, chat with your advisor, um, facilitator, and see what are the things that you need to do um, before you move on. So basically, folks, at this stage, I'm going to bring in Peter and Carl. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, Peter and Carl McCahan here from uh, Valley Castle. So just uh, in case there's any confusion uh, on your screen there, Peter's on the left with the blue jumper and Carl on the right. So that's who the fellas are. So well, are you there, Bill? Yep. Yep. Good evening, Sam. How's things? Not the bad. Good man. You sir. You sir. Fit and well. You sir. Looking so good to see you. Good to see. Uh, well, sir. Sure. Looks good this evening. Uh, very, very, very. very. <laughs> well, <laughs> folks, as I say, uh, I'd like to thank Peter and Carl for you know volunteering or whatever you want to want to call it for a uh, for tonight's um session on OPA. Um, so basically what we're going to do is there's going to be a series of wee videos or a video um, through the thing. We'll have see photographs of the farm. Obviously, we can't get out. But what Peter and Carl are going to do is give us a wee background on the farm, what the, the things they find or what things they're looking at, sorry, um, things they're looking for in the future. And then we'll um, Patrick will be coming in on the OPA section. There will be a wee video, uh, as Graham has mentioned, when they were scanning mm -hmm. at, at McCann's farm. So basically, Folks, uh, maybe tell us a wee bit about the farm. Peter, are you going to start off? Or? Yep, no, I'll uh, start off here now. That's a, a part-time farm run between Carl and myself here now. Uh, both of us work off-farm uh, on our day jobs, and we get family help there at the weekends. Another brother there, we uh, take him out of hiding at the weekend, and he gives a hand out there now, so uh, that is a good help at times there now. Uh, it runs with 650 yows, uh, takes all mules, clins and mule bred yows and uh, the rest is made up with Scottish blackface. We run on sort of 120-130 uh, takes all mule mule yows and roughly about the same in clins and then the rest is made up with Scottish blackface. Uh, some of them yows, there's about 200 of them run on, on another out farm uh, on a common ground. So uh, that's the background to them. Oh, well, we haven't actually mentioned it, but you, you've you have a suckler herd as well, Peter. We have a suckler herd as well there now. Uh, we run thirty five cows, suck cows there now, and uh, the calves are run through to strong stores and sold eighteen to twenty four months. Uh, we run a limousine bull with them there now as well. So very good, very good. I was just say here you, the ground, like you know, it is. You're in a tough area, like you know, you're well up there. You know, it'd be quite. 
a lot of rainfall, I think, Peter? I uh, generally... Uh... We get uh, quite a lot of rainfall. Uh, the day that we scanned, there was a lot of rainfall that day. Now, uh, typically, the average rainfall for our area would be uh, about 1.2, 1.3 metres. I suppose in old money, it's about four and a quarter feet there and around that there. Kind of average rainfall. Uh, it's got the rainfall amounts taught up for this year so far, and they're on then about a metre or just over three feet there now so far to date. So they're on target again. They had the, the four foot mark again for rainfall amounts. So unfortunately yeah well that's what said it's just painting the picture that it is a challenging area you know and i say i've been up several times obviously pre-covid and you know while it's it's nice in the summertime it's like in a lot of places in the hills you know it's, it's a tough tough existence so as you say there you 40 hectares grass at uh, 300 to rough rough hill and that's over several bits of ground hey peter that's right uh, it's run over uh several bits of ground that there is uh would be sort of the main well not the main but the the main silage ground, so it would yeah. be uh, that would be the main yard area there now as well, yeah. just where the wee mouse is there. That's the sheep house, okay. just where it is, and then uh, the cattle sheds there as well. Now uh, those fields there, I say they'll be the main silage fields, and the sheep are turned out of them after lambing. Okay. This this plot of ground here now, it is uh, be an out farm there, and that would be used for cotton silage off as well. Okay. Uh, and then this block of ground here now, this will be the sort of main grazing area for twin rear ewes or ewes that's rearing twin lambs and it'll be grazing the cattle there now for the summertime. Uh, there will be a fairly heavy ground there now which would, it would get wet on whenever there's a lot of rain and uh, to be truthfully honest you can lose a welly in it very handy now or even to both of them if you weren't watching. So. <laughs> very good. This thing that is already showing some of it now, Peter, but there's obviously a bit more, but just for the uh, This here would be the sort of the main upland ground at home here now, so it would be it's just a general rough grazing type of ground. Uh, over along the right hand side, there's a bit of con acre that we take, because there's about 60 acres in it. That's the only con acre that we have. Yeah, and this so, is actually with, with the handling yards, is Peter somewhere up, if I'm right about uh, here? There are a bit the middle there, sitting in there. All right, okay. roughly. Uh, so, uh, they're sort of central and not below the grounds that they are. Okay, very good, very good. Right, so basically, maybe tell us a wee bit more, like your your yo types there. I'll say we'll show some wee photographs now in a few minutes. Um, um, you've mentioned there, so maybe just tell what type of yo's, what's your traditional, are you changing, you know, what's your tips, that type of stuff? Uh, traditionally, we would uh, run a mule, Texel mule uh, flock, and they would be run along with uh, Texel and Suffolk rams there. Uh, the last couple of years we enter just uh, Cambridge ram just to get a few more numbers into it. Uh, the Clin Yows, they would uh, run with the Clin ram again there now, just put by again. And uh, back to the hill again, and they would run along with uh, the, the Scottish Blackface Yows there now too. Right. Uh, and the, the Blackface Yows, uh, they're originally Perth type. Yows, uh, then we moved more so on to the Lanark yows. They are all bred for the hill, but uh, we noticed after the Lanark that the, the lambs or the sheep would have been, the yows would have been getting smaller. And we also noticed the barn rates increasing slightly on them there now as well. Plus uh, the hardiness sort of wore out of them a bit. So we entered just a swale tip to them as well. So we're getting a, we got a half swale yow there for a lot of years and they have increased the, the or decreased the barn rate. Okay. Slightly as well there now, and there'll yeah. be a hard, hard area, your good mothers with plenty of milk there as well. Okay. And we'll, say, we'll just come on to these last two points, just now we'll come back now. The, your lamb, say, your mm. thin and out lamb, and like you have the lamb and shed was seen there, um, and obviously that saves a bit of hassle at, at uh, the common time. Yeah, um, no, that's handy there now. So as uh, all the yows at home, on the home floor or the home ground there, they'll be all lambed inside, and then the yows on the common ground, they'll be lambed outside, although they're... They're not lambing to the middle of April, the end of April time there now, because of where they're at on the hill. Yeah. Uh, just we lamb all the yews inside there now. Uh, we don't split them for inside and out for the, the crossbred blackface. Uh, everything's all in. Uh, just it saves more t or saves time going away to look sheep outside and you're fit to keep an eye on things all at the one time and everything's all on yep. one roof. That's, that's handy. Um, now, this is the, the third point there. You keep most of the doe lambs, and this may be coming into some of the things we want to look at. Um, you've been doing that more out of necessity than, than choosing, maybe, Peter, or would that be right? 
Uh, it would be selling. Uh, generally, we would keep, to be honest, we keep too many replacement yew lambs. Uh, and through this program, uh, looking at the animal health and the OPA, uh, we realised that the, re the replacements was, was too high. Yeah. And sometimes we have to purchase on meals there now just to try and keep the flock up. But hopefully, as uh, we've seen so far, that there's less uh, mortality in the yews over yep. the year, so uh, this seems to be paying off this OPA scanning here now. Good, good. Well, as I say, that is one of the things that was set down here at the start, and we'll come back over it again, is when we did the benchmark and we looked at the figures, and that was something, you know, that, that came out that, you know, the numbers that you were having to keep to more or less stand still, you know, as we said. Now, I'll just jump back to Cambridge there, which somebody may not have seen. This is him on the left-hand side of the screen, Peter. That's um, right. Again, That's right. And that's your clen on the right. Uh, how have they perform? You know, you're using the clen on the mountain as such, or the hill anyway. Uh, the clen will be going on to the hill, back to the hill again there now. Uh, they seem to be working all right on the hill, so they do. They uh, they have more lambs out of them than what the blackface would have, and uh, you get a better or a better market for them, better price at sale time for them there now as well. Yeah. They're fa fairly easy care uh, sheep. There are very little problems with them. Although, saying that, you get the problems as well that are not. All easy care as such. Um, how, long, how, long, how, long, how long have you been keeping the um, the cleanse, Peter? The cleanse they uh, were introduced fifteen years ago. There now, roughly, uh, and we've just bred them through from the blackface, and then we're just continually putting the cleanse back onto the clean ram again. There now, so that's the way we're working it. Okay, okay, excellent. So then, what do we have here, Peter? Just a. Uh, that's a few of the, the lambs that we're fattening this year now. Generally, we wouldn't fatten any lambs, but uh, just through this programme that we are uh, weighing lambs during the summertime and that there. Uh, these are the few, some of the stronger lambs that we have that we pulled out just before sale time, before the store sales. And uh, we reckon there's no point in selling them on to people who turn around and make a, a pound or two at them within a couple of weeks. So we might as well just keep them ourselves and throw a taste of meal to them and fatten them ourselves and get as much as we can out of them. Excellent, excellent. Well, I say that's what we're going to talk about. You no, know, as I say, what things were changing. Um, this is your handling facility, uh, Peter. Uh, that's that's a, yeah, the... Uh, that's the handling facilities at home there now. Yeah, it's just a basic handling facilities, uh, shedder, handling pens, uh, just to be raised for dosing and, and a dipper there. Uh, in the middle there, just you see your roof, that's over the top of the footpath. That serves two purposes it uh, keeps the footpath dry. And we put a roof on it, and that collects the water just to service the, the footpath. So that's a, a labour saving tip there now as well, just for folk. Thanks. Well, I wouldn't say Peter's anything basic about it. It's a very, it's a very well constructed, and I know I've been at it uh, last year, and it is, it's impressive. You know, the photograph doesn't really do it justice. Um, we're going to see it in a video uh, later on when Patrick was up with yourself scanning. So it wasn't as nice a day as that was, um, but at least we can see what it is. Um, so what we have now, folks, Peter, you've always you've mentioned their labour saving, which is an issue as well, and animal health, which is what we're trying to focus mainly on tonight. So we'll have now, it's just a wee video this. Maybe tell us what, what we're seeing here, hey, Peter. These here would be uh, the hoggets on the, the common ground there. Now, uh, we had them in for uh, getting vaccinated for Toxivax. Uh, a lot of years ago, we found a problem that uh, there's too many barren yews and yews giving birth to dead lambs. So uh, we decided to just send lambs away for... for uh, post mortem, and that's what it come back as was toxoplasmosis. So we uh, blanket vaccinated all the yews on both flocks, or all the flocks, and uh, we vaccinate all incoming sheep into this into the flock there now as well. And, and do, uh, do Enzo as well, Peter? Enzo, we uh, just we don't have a problem for Enzo on the farm, but we vaccinate all bought in stock just as a precaution, more so than anything else, just because we don't want to end. We don't have it, and nor we don't want it, and either. No, excellent, excellent. And I say, obviously, there's two other uh, participants in this video, like uh, a big part on your on the hill uh, farm, like the the dogs there now. I they're uh, they're very much at times very helpful and useful now. At times, they have an old dog there, and then with a new dog in the picture, you always have to keep a dog coming on there now as well. So you, you, you always they. They know the limits of our quad just as much as what we do. So if uh, if you don't have the dog, then you might as well just sit in the house there. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. Very good. Um, again, Peter, what if I, this is a fairly fresh looking field here? 
Uh, that's a uh, field we reseed it this year now, right? We uh, try and reseed a field or maybe a couple of fields every year. Uh, this field here in particular, it was ploughed in the middle of August and sowed out. Uh, that gets 15 kilos an acre of Aber high sugar grass seed, uh, along with a kilo of clover and through it. At uh, two bags of 2010-10 and one bag of potash and afterwards, uh, we've done the potash because the field was soil sampled this year and it was showing low in potash. So we just gave it a booster once it was reseeded there. Excellent, excellent, very good. Well, I say that is important. Like everybody in the program has soil fertility, taking soil fertility uh, analysis, and uh, you know we work with that accordingly. Right, we're going to get on to some of the nitty gritty near now. Um, so this is just a wee quick view down from from the Hallinan facility. As you say, that's the type of ground, Peter, that you're you're dealing with. Um, oh, so again, just given uh, that's just a, a general view out from the handling pens there now. Uh, it's upland grazing, you can see shelter belts and that there now as well. There are a lot of trees planted, so uh, we'd be fairly open there. And uh, we get a strong east wind, which would do a lot of scorching. And, and uh, well, I guess I don't like to be out in an east wind, and I, I wouldn't blame the sheep for lying in at the back of the ditch there, yeah. there now, so I wouldn't. No, that's that's what it's all about. It's comfort, comfort yeah, for everybody. Well, uh, well, as I say, Peter, as you know, uh, everybody in the program, when, when we started, um, when I went out, we sat down with yourselves and we started to see what are the farm goals. And uh, these were what we came up with. And as I say, everybody's different. Some people were the grazing stuff was maybe quicker, you know, further down the line. Some was pushed off a wee bit. But maybe tell us, I think we'll maybe focus because what we are talking about tonight is the whole flock health thing, Peter, and specifically OPA. So maybe just tell us a wee bit about the flock health. Why, you know, why did that come out or why was that your main priority? I will maybe just let Carl. Carl, Carl right, far enough. Yeah, yep. uh -huh. yeah, well, I suppose. Um, I suppose we were just um, getting too many uh, barn rate or barn yews, and we were trying to find the the problem, try to find the solution, or find the problem and and the solution. Yep. Um. The uh, I suppose we started um, we started doing something that there a lot of the lambs and uh, things like that too, um, and uh, just before and after the um, uh, the drenching. As well, and we've also uh, undertook a lot of blood testing too to uh, find out what trace elements are like and things like that. Excellent. As well, yeah. Well, as I say, as we say, Carly, that was one of the days, one of the first days when it came out, and I know we had a fairly, yeah. You know, well, that's the way we do a frank, honest conversation, looking at your benchmark, and which uh, sat down and like you know, the 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 figures just weren't as where you would want them to be in terms of you know numbers and I think Peter's has said like too many replacements, not enough going out the gate, you know, and that's where you say, mm -hmm. well, there's a reason, there's a reason for that, and you know, hats off to you, you have <laughs> you've gone at it and gone at it well, you know. Yeah, it's it is you know it's it's, it's something to say you know you have to go and do the thing. There's no point in saying oh that's just the way it is, you know, and you and you've and you've looked at it. So that's basically what um, you've looked at that. And we'll discuss that a wee bit a wee bit more. The next bit. Uh, we had down three to four paddock grazing, but you've been doing a wee bit of uh, other than set stocking already, Carl, haven't you? Uh, well, I suppose we sort of started into uh, rotational grazing maybe, maybe about 10 years ago now at this stage. Um, that, that main block of uh, grazing ground that was shown earlier on, that was really only dividing two, and uh, we divided it up into um, <clears throat> maybe six or so pi or, um, fields. About, Roughly about four four acres or so, four to five acres each, and um, I suppose then this year we've developed a wee bit further. We've started to measure grass, and uh, we found that quite interesting. Um, plus, it gave us a better idea what the the exit covers were. You know, to take the take the stock out at um, where we had been taking them out at before. We were finding we could get in our couple of days, um, and we found the tighter we grazed it, the tight, the quicker it came back, um, which which helped as well. Excellent, as we say, Man. and that's you say you've really took on to it, and it's 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 um, it's been great, you know, the information and the questions that they're asking. And I say we'll, we'll chat about that a wee bit later on. But you say you have it's given you a wee bit more confidence, car like the measuring there and things like that there, just to say I have a, get a bit more out of that. That's right, I um, like I said, um, I'd, I'd just to clean clean the paddocks out better, and uh, and as I say, it seemed to encourage the grass growth to come back again. Uh, all, all the quicker. Like we we went from before not 
grass running out in the middle of July. Um, to this year, I think we were stocked at uh, like three, three point three livestock units per hectare. Like, um, really pushed it this year and like, um, done well for us. Excellent, excellent, very good. We'll see. We'll maybe come back to them later on. And then the final one there, something maybe down the line, EID or electronic identification, something maybe you're thinking about. Yeah, it was something I've always sort of thought about. Um, but um, I think we're thinking more about it now. Um, we we have done a lot of manual recording this year, and it's been uh, as it is time consuming to to record manually, um, and it'll probably be more accurate with a an EAD system. Yeah, as well. Just um, but uh, that's was all the lambs were tagged at birth this year, um, and that's that's the way we tagged them there, just yeah. to the front of the year. And um, just about a thumbnail out from the from the side of the head on each side. And this this is out of your Cambridge, this boy here. That's right. Uh, he'd be one of the Cambridge lambs, yeah. Yep. Um, so his, um, they've. No, I'm 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 pleased with the way he's, he's breeding. Um, so he's he's supposed to have high a high maternal figure. Yeah. Um, so it's more the, the more the um more the lambs. Yep. I know the, 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 the lambs, yeah. So. Yep. So. yep. Excellent. Excellent. Right, Carl, now we're getting on to the, the wee bit that people go, oh, I don't know why I want to look at this, but this is the bit that we'll have to, you know, the targets, what is it that your farm wants to do? Um, these figures in the middle of 2019, obviously, we are benchmarking results. Um, and I just have to emphasize, I just, at the very first, the, the gross margin at the bottom is, you know, that's for average, uh, like we've done lowland farms previously. Um, and people think, oh, well, that's, that's that's very, very low. But in a hill situation, that's about average, you know. But however, that's not where we want to be. Um, we want to be better than that. So I just want to draw that quickly to attention if anybody just sees that there. So basically, we're going to start off with the scanning, uh, Peter and, or Charles, maybe. Um, you know, those are the figures. There's where you want to be. Um, let me just, uh, and maybe more so the weaning one where the problem seems to have been. Yeah, that's right, yeah. No, the um, I suppose getting getting the lambs out the gate is 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 what we're we're trying to achieve. Um, or we're having enough of the well, the the scan figures weren't too bad, but we want to try and push it on a wee bit further. Yep. Um, and hopefully, as, as I say, the that the the the, Cam the Cambridge tip was an index of two point eight uh, on the maternal side, so we're hoping that'll that'll push the lamb numbers too. Yeah. Uh, on that on that side of things. Um, and then I suppose the the the, the, the hell use um, there on the common they're they're one point two. Um, that is that is a fairly hard hill, um, and they never they would never leave it all year. You know to be on it all year year round. Yep. Um, so uh, again, we're trying to maybe push it up to to one point five. Yep. I'd hope to really try and to get better management and things like that. You know, of the heather. Things. The weaning thing, obviously, that's the one really where we're coming in, and potentially the OPA is was having an effect. Um, you know, that's been a, a figure that you weren't happy with over the a few years, like so. You know, uh, and you're addressing it. That's right. Uh, we've started to look into um, into well, we we or I suppose our win percentage when we were down, we were losing maybe too many ewes as well, um, and that was that was a, a ultimate effect in the the, the winning percentage. Yeah. Um, as well. Um, so we're we're just trying to address and keep keep an eye on uh, on on the performance of the lambs too uh, throughout the throughout the, the 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 season. Yeah, yeah. But you say you have to get the the yos have to be there, and you say you were losing yos for whatever reason, and you say OPA, which we're talking about this evening, is a contributory factor or seems to be at this stage. You know, and it's something we're we're going to continue to look at. Um, and then the next bit, the store lambs and the replacements that like you have started, you know, you've traditionally been a, a store lamb farm, like a, as a lot of supposed farms in the area. That's right. Yeah, most of most of our lambs would would, um, would go with stores. Um, I was always sort of maybe part guilty was we didn't sort of it was a, it was maybe a handier option, mm -hmm. um, to, uh, just to last ever night to the market. Um, but uh, now I started to look at. Look at suppose, ways of adding value, and yep. uh, that's uh, we're maybe trying to maybe finish a few this year just to see how we get on. Good ma, good ma. And I say the stock rate there, like you know, it's it's slightly different to the lowland situation because obviously you have that hard hill. It's more like a carrying capacity as opposed to a stocking rate. But you could maybe push it a wee bit. You know, would that be the cows or the yos or a bit of both or what do you think? 
Uh, well, probably a wee maybe. Um, well, we're probably happy enough with where the cows is at um, at the minute. Um, we'll probably when we push on a wee bit with, uh, with, with the ewes. Um, and I know uh, that we probably could carry a few more uh, on it, but then uh, we're we're there thereabouts. But it's um, don't want to increase the workload too much uh, no. either. Um, so, but we'll. Um, like I say, there, there is room for improvement, but within reason. Well, no, no, that's exactly right. And yeah. There's no point in, you know, it's all right putting down figures, but you have to be practical and you, you're supposed to work working as a lot of people are. So we'll have to be realistic with these things. But you say, you should make measurements, you know where you're at and you know where you want to go. So that's that's exactly right. So I so said, these are just points we've actually, we've, we've covered these anyway, Carl, you know, that's what you just wanted to do. Sell more lambs, Get the barn rate down, and obviously keep less replacements, or have to buy in replacements. That, be, you know, I think that'd be fair yeah. enough to say. That'd be fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, we've uh, we've we've we'd be keeping the replacements too, just um for we'll, we'll try and keep as many replacements as we can too, because we can't stop the hell with what and sheep really. Yeah. Um, we need to keep try and keep our own to a certain degree, but just not totally not keep as many. Yeah, no, that's exactly. And again, again, that's your bottom line. If you're saving more, you're not buying your replacement costs as well. And obviously, the grass that we've mentioned um, to to change that as well. So, we've mentioned there earlier on the the recording system. You like to go to the EAD, um, but you have started this year as a new thing. I think Charles, you're the man that's done got this short straw, whatever you want to call it. Hey, uh, doing. The uh, thing. I was handed the pencil and told to get on it. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, no, this uh, this year we we did we, we we made a point of tagging everything at birth and recording it against uh, against the ewes. Um and and to be honest with you, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't out of the way of regards time because we were we'd be um, tail docking and and painting and and all that sort of thing well, as lambs in the house anyway. And it was just it was only a matter of um, you'd take an hour every day and and go around all the pens and and it wasn't. It wasn't really taking up much, too much time to do it yeah. um, uh, at that time. Plus, we were saving on the time. We didn't have to tag lambs before sale. So yeah. it, um, I would say it probably averaged itself out in the in the grand scheme of things anyway. Yeah. And again, the, the next and the bit in the red there, which is something we want to make sure is emphasised for on OPA, is that you don't be in having a recording system that you were able to say, well, down the line, well, I know where that lamb was, and after the other day or the last week, or sorry, a few weeks ago, you were able to say, "Right, them yours are going." There's a lamb will not be going as well. Like you can work back. That's right. Yeah, you can. Um, you can. You can get the um, the family tree if you like, and uh, and and root, root out the problems. That's dead on. So again, we'll just maybe quickly go through the next wee bit. Now, the grass and improvement we've kind of mentioned there that you're you're measuring grass and, and on the paddocks. Um, maybe Peter. You maybe mentioned a bit on the health plan, like uh, all the farms obviously had um, a health, health plan undertaken, and I uh, sat with your vet uh, on that occasion as well. What what came out of that, uh, Peter? I'll, uh, we spent a lot of time now with the vet, and uh, he went into it in uh, great detail, and he told us to keep an eye on uh, mortality, why lambs you always die, uh, to send them away and get a post-mortem done on them. And uh, he also recommended that we one of the main things was scanning for OPA because uh, we told him that there's a lot of most of our mortality occurred in the eyes between uh, the ram going out to them and lambing time, more so nearly between scanning time and lambing time there now. Uh, I suppose that's never the biggest stress is on the eyes and that's never the OPA comes into effect and the eyes is never they're under stress and pressure. Yep. And uh, during the, the summertime there, once the lambs are on the ground, uh, just to perhaps blood test the lambs to see if there's any mineral issues in that there in the eyes or in the lambs. And yep. uh, also do uh, dunk something for worms, the fake leg count there now as well. I see you're doing all that there. So you have taken yeah. a fair few things from that as well. That's yeah. excellent. Uh, um, and then just the last one there, Peter, the soil, you know, obviously all the ground's been sampled. What have you come up with anything along those lines? Uh, we sample the ground every uh, three years, just as a as a rule of thumb. Uh, we sample every individual field by themselves. Uh, some people may think that's a lot of cost, but that's not really in the grand scheme of things. For say a few pounds, you can save yourself a different uh, type of fertilizer. Uh, really, all our or all our fields 
are all fairly good for pH, which would be the main thing that comes out of the, the soil sample there. Now, if you haven't got the pH right, then the rest of the fertilizers, like compounds or nitrogen, even they don't uh, work the same. Yeah. Uh, the most of our farm is sitting uh, 6.1, 6.2 and above, sometimes up to 6.6, 6.7 there now for some of the stronger fields we lay. Uh, there is a couple in there now which were uh, down at 5.9. They get a, a good heavy dressing earlier on in the springtime and they'll probably get another dressing again next spring as well. Okay. Uh, as regards to the fertility, the potassium and uh, potash there now, uh, they're all, yeah. or the phosphorus, I sorry, and uh, they're all fairly good. They're all sitting an index of two. There are some of them are higher there now as well for the, the phosphate, uh, which whenever we're sowing fertilizer, we take that into account. And um, generally, most of the grass gets all uh, just a straight nitrogen or a can uh, fertilizer. But whenever we're sowing silage there now, uh, we would get a, like a 25 10 type of mix of mm. fertilizer there now just to. So then we're not adding any more phosphate onto the ground. Good man, and excellent, excellent. Right now we're getting on a wee bit into where the the OPA is kind of coming in, uh, Peter. Um, like as I say, all all the farms or most of the farms now have scanned. Um, you to scan last year, um, come up about eight percent, and then you got to scan there uh, over five or six weeks ago with Pablo. That's right. Down now to four percent overall, like this. People say that's not a lot. That's a fifty percent reduction, which mm -hmm. is very, very significant. Um, what if someone, you know, and then there's just your lamb seals or um, if someone was say, well, what does that mean? What would you call that in money terms, or how would you work that in on the ground, or how would you calculate it out? You know what I mean? I will, uh, like as you say there, like that, that dropped fifty percent there now between one year and another. Last year, twenty nineteen was the first year we done it, and we called hard. We didn't take any prisoners at all on anything that showed any sign of anything in the lungs there now. We just got rid of it. And uh, this year we found that there was less yows dying before lambing time there now. So that you take there at 50%, if we have another even 25 yows running on the farm there with lambs in the ground, at, even if they only have single lambs and selling them at stores at a bad price of £60. Which would yes. leave you with fifteen hundred pound in your pocket, and if if they had twins, then twenty four lamb or twenty or forty eight fifty lambs there now selling at yes. sixty pound leaves you with an extra three thousand pound in your pocket there now. So, like yep. and that, and that there, you may some, some people may think that the OPA scanning is there, but but whenever you look at it in them terms there, it's cheap in the grand scheme of things there now. Yeah, well, that's exactly as you say. One, no, but fifteen hundred or three thousand pound between one and two, like that's that's a massive, that is a massive amount of money, you know. Mm -hmm. and, Especially you know, for for very few extra yows on the ground, really, at the end of the day. Yep, exactly. And then the lambs again this year. Um, generally, you still have a, a large proportion, obviously, of stores. Um, you still have your number of replacements, but you're actually starting to finish through through the scheme as well. Like you've you know that you've. The grass has maybe got a bit better. The lambs have grown a bit better. Aye, that's right. Now we've, we will just with the way in that they were fit to get a better picture of what uh, what the lambs were doing and how the yews were fit to cope with the lambs. Yeah. And uh, we pulled out for it of the heaviest lambs, and we got here on them through onto the to the abbot there now as well. So good man, good man. Well, that's exactly, and that's the picture here. That's what it's about. It's getting them boys there or girls through and selling, and that's why you know if OPA is an issue in the background, you aren't going to have as many as them to go through. Um, that that were to get to the factory. Um, again, Carl, you've actually mentioned this bit here that you've you've done a bit more. Gra you've run grass measurements, sorry, um, and you you found a fair be benefit out of that. That's right. Um, I our grass with our grazing platform would have been measured um, um, weekly uh, during the grazing season, and uh, and we were fitting better match the uh, the demand to the supply. And uh, and keep things moving on. Um, like I say, there was I was split up into about six six so fields, and they're all about four acres each. Uh, there's one one big field in it, about ten acres, and we're looking to to split that again, maybe once or uh, or twice or three, and two or three uh, fields from that. Okay. Um, it's nothing we're probably looking at. And as I say, the the plate meter just gives you a better idea. It gives you a wee bit more confidence, as you say, just and. Um, to know where, where you're at and, and where you're going. 
Excellent, excellent. I know you've been you've been very good and and you know asking the questions and going stuff through it. And then yeah. we can just finally um, the environmental farming scheme. Uh, maybe Peter, maybe you come in here. You you you've, you're in the wider one. I think you maybe applied to the higher higher one. Maybe tell us a wee bit about that, Peter. What have you done, or what do you hope to get out of that? I we've uh, for the for the wider one there now we've done a lot of. Hydro planting and tree line boundary, and we've done a, a bit of uh, watercourse fencing as well. That's just some of the the hydro planting with the the tree line in the middle of it there now as well. That yep. was under under the wider, and uh, uh, we've applied at the minute there now. We've got the plan sent through on to uh to approve for the the higher scheme there now as well. So hopefully we'll be fit to get uh, something out of it too. Uh, and what what have you found? Like obviously. I will find that uh, well we uh, we're fit for the wider net there. We're able to uh, manage the ground better there now as well, and we're trying to get more out of the grass. And uh, hopefully, in the years to come, there'll be a uh, shelter to the fields there now with the hedgerows. And with a bit of luck, we'll uh, hopefully be a few more wildlife on on the farm there now as well, uh, nesting in the hedges and everything. Excellent. Yeah, like I said there's more. There's more to it, and yeah, exactly that's, that's what we want to hear. Well, here, boys, I'm going to give you a bit of a breather now. This is the last, the last wee bit, um, and we'll just finish with this wee bit for now. What on the McCoffins farm, Peter and Carl? These are some of the things we've chatted about. Maybe we could go through some of these. Obviously, we've mentioned the grass one, but maybe could just through some of these things just uh, briefly to say where you are hoping to go. I well, that's right. Um, uh, as, as I suppose the grass is, is fairly well covered there. At that um, I suppose we'll just try to keep keep the grass younger and, and uh, improve the silage quality and things like that too. Um, we split up a few more fields and, uh, but like I say, we try and reseed the field every year to to keep keep that right. Um, I suppose the EID is something that we are going to seriously look at. Um, hopefully try and get something in place maybe for for next year. Um, definitely would think of uh, some sort of software package. Be more more time efficient than me for a start, and uh, probably better accuracy because sometimes the figures don't look what they should look like. A six can look like a zero or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, I suppose the the the, the rams too, um, but the EBVs they're very they're quite hard to to, to source. Um, we're, we we went looking for them this year, and we found them very hard. I suppose to talk about supply and demand, but it's very hard to get a demand when there's no supply. Um, and uh, but it's uh, it was proven proven quite a challenge um, to to get one. Um, I suppose uh, on the labour efficiency too, we need to look maybe more so at um, we bring in contractors a wee bit more. Um, as uh, I suppose it's more important that the job's done when it's supposed to be done rather than who does it. And uh, we'll be uh, we'll be looking looking at that a wee bit more too. Yep. And the, the thing. And then, I suppose overall, try to just improve that the flock health and reduce the barn rate, yep. and, uh, and get more get lambs out the gate. That's exactly what it's about, you know, and that's 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 really what we're talking. About. Obviously, the OPA is the thing we're we're going to mention now. So basically, yes. folks, um, Ben, thank you very much. You'll have a wee bit of a rest now. Um, I'm going to give a wee brief background on the OPA um, that was that was worked up through Greenmount, and Patrick Grant, uh, the vet, has been involved with that as well. And then Patrick is coming in to uh, do his part on it. So basically, OPA, folks, very only two slides here. It's a very common disease. Um, the problem with it is that it's largely undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Oh, it's something else or oh, you always ask the do the day. You know, it's this, that and the other, you know. It affects all breeds. That's the one big thing I want to make sure that it's not a specific to any one breed, um, despite what people may have said um, around the country. It affects productivity and productivity and profitability. Sorry, as as Peter and Card have said, you know the lambs are the yews aren't there, the lambs aren't there. You have nothing to sell. And the big problem there is it's obviously highly contagious. Now within Greenman and my colleague Eddie McCluskey was involved in this. Um, this is just a, a, a wee table of the scanning that was done, I think started with Patrick about three years ago. And the the we've done four scans since that. The axis and the double dots are Patrick's way and the single dots, and Patrick will explain that in a wee minute, but briefly, the X and the double dots are definites or highly suspicious OPA cases. 
So in that case, Greenmount, they, in, with Greenmount policy, they were called out of it. The single dots may not be, you know, there could be something else, uh, another uh, respiratory, respiratory disease or something. But all I really want to show there is that over the last number of years, through OPA scanning, through culling, and through other policies, that has gone from 5.5 to 5 to 3.1 to not even 0.1 on the right hand side. So that is how effective the scanning process has been in, in, in the reduction of OPA. So that's really all I want to, to say about that, um, just to show Green Mounts that we've been doing it for a number of years and we've had the, the, the open event there last year and there's something we're going to be highlighting through the programme um, as well. So folks, that's all for me. Um, thank you very much. I'm now going to pass over to Patrick Grant. Um, Patrick, are you you're there? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me all right, Senna? Good man. Yeah, good to hear another morning, man. I thought it was on my own there all evening. Ah, uh, well, you're the you're the wrong side of the mountain, Senna. We'll not that, talk about that now. I know that. I know that. <laughs> Dead on. I'll take over anyway. So, I uh, I work completely at sheep really at this time of year. I'm a hard man to get because usually I'm uh, trying to get them in lamb. So, but. Generally, uh, other months, particularly the, the start of the year, mid-pregnancy and uh, early summer, I do a lot of the scanning um, for OPA. Um, it was developed by Phil Scott over in Edinburgh. Um, and it's a, it's the, the issue with diagnosing OPA is that it cannot really be diagnosed by a blood test because you have uh, no circulating antibody and no circulating virus. Um, and these are the two things that we test for whenever we test bloods. So it was very hard to diagnose, and that's how the, 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 the process of the scanning came about, and I'll, I'll explain how to do that. But the first instance for me is, well, why do we want to control the exigency? And certainly uh, Peter and Carl there have went through their experiences. Um, they also give some lovely pictures of their handling facility, which... <laughs> I didn't see because the rain was lashing that hard that day. Um, I could. It's nice to actually hear them talk because I couldn't even hear them talk that day. It was that bad when we were up. So, uh, hopefully, the video will portray that later on. Listen, it's financial. If we're going to do something in the sheep industry, it has to be. It's it's about finance. So, for me, um, a lot of the flocks that have the issues, it's mortality in the ewes. And just reducing that, so we have the cost of, first of all, that ewe's not going to be on the farm, she's not going to be producing money for you anymore. And of course, once a day on the farm, you're having to pay to get her lifted, um, so it's dead money. Uh, we're increasing the cull value, so if I can pick these ewe's out, there is a cull value against them at that stage. A lot of the time we, we associate um, body condition score and we think thin, uh, thin ewe's will potentially um, be the be the, the, the the case whenever it's uh, the exactly is involved. However, it's not really like that. You know, a lot of the time the body condition only starts to fall off them whenever two thirds of their lung um, can be tumor. So we're taking use a lot of the time with a decent call value. And and that's just getting into a more productive view uh, and a more productive form. Ethically, we also have to think about it is, is these sheep have a lung cancer? And it's a it's a major disease and that's causing stress when the flocks. So we have to deal with it that way. And and lastly, of course, the further ramifications. So it's all about the betrayal of the sheep industry and just the, the idea of these sheep running in the flock. And, and we can't, we, we don't want another stick to beat ourselves with. Um, so it is a disease where if it's on the farm and we can diagnose it, then we, we want to deal with it. So that we're shown to be uh, treating the users ethically and as well and, and looking after the welfare. So um, this is a this is a green mount shed. So it's a nice picture of us scanning the sheep. So I, I scan through the a combi clamp, so it's one to take on farm. Um, combi clamp's a great bit of kit for catching them. We're, we're, we are catching them about halfway out, as you can see. Um, and then I scan both lungs. So I scan them in the, the non-wool covered area underneath the legs. So the legs sort of pull forward. And uh, just then underneath that, I'll scan both sides. So it's about three, um, three rib spaces uh, worth. Um, this is the ventral lung lobes. So that means the bottom lung lobes. And around the heart, and that's mainly where we we find that the the tumors uh, will will first uh, show up. And then I lung score them. So whenever I get the ultrasound, um, the ultrasound goes penetrates through the the body wall, and it'll in a normal lung, a uh, normal lungs full of air, so the ultrasound doesn't penetrate any further. So what happens in a normal lung, as we can see in the bottom image here, we get a bright white line. 
um, showing up um, on normal lung because uh, the ultrasound bounces straight back and we show nothing in underneath it. It's whenever this white line's broken or we're starting to see other um, structures uh, deeper into the lung field. And then I'm trying the lung scored on either damage to that pleural surface, consolidation, which is like a, where we'd find tumours or just non-aerated areas of the lung, which are sort of consolidated down, and the involvement also of abscesses and pleurisy and other problems can be diagnosed. So firstly, the, the damage to the pleural surface. So, well, again, this is a variation. It's not a straightforward um, test because you're, I'm trying to diagnose it as I'm seeing it. And I diagnose it very quickly where I'm looking at maybe limited damage. So if I just see um, this white line being broken, small marks in it, small bits of damage, um, I will record her down as a, a single dot. And we'll explain that later on. But for me, it's a limited damage. I may record it. I may put her in that sort of that area and we'll deal with her separately. But if I'm finding more extensive damage, so the, the image on the right here is actually pleurisy. So we're seeing that bright white line and we're seeing just above it, um, each one of these squares that you're seeing in the image is one centimeter squared. And the black area above that is a fluidy area of the lung and that's pleurisy sitting on the surface of the lung. So pleurisy, again, if there's nothing else involved, that can be that can be to do with a bacterial infection. It's not always associated with OPA. And we can deal with it in, in, in a couple of different ways. If I'm seeing nothing else, it's just pleurisy. I'll mark her with a P and we and we can decide to treat her with long-term antibiotics. But if I'm seeing her other um, other problems associated, um, she will then be placed in a highly suspicious group with two dots or if there's tumours or something else associated into the X. And it's, it just depends on the severity. So here we're seeing uh, the consolidated areas of the lung. And this is uh, this is the image of the ultrasound on the left compared to the postmortem area on the right. So if we look at the right first, we'll see the normal aerated, aerated lung up on the, the top of the lung, which is nice and pink. It's uh, nearly a foamy feel to it, where the, the bottom of the lung the right on, on the right is gray. It's hard. There's nowhere in that. And if you felt it, it, it feels hard. There's a big difference. Now, the position of the lesion, whenever I'm seeing, I, I'm wanting to pick this up whenever it's around a sugar cube in size. You know, I'm trying to pick it up as small as I can. So for me, the smaller the lesion, I have to look at where it's positioned. Is it in that area of the lung, just beneath the, beside the heart, uh, where most of these lesions occur? Um, or is it somewhere else? Could this be a, a lungworm lesion? Could this be a bacterial uh, lesion? So I, I have to sort of grade it accordingly. I look at the size of the lesion, and again, then I'll start to, to put it in the highly suspicious group or the, you know, the, the the positive group, depending on the severity. As I say, this scan here, quite obviously, we can actually see the heart beneath the lung on the left field. So that's um, the atrium and the ventricle of the heart, which we're seeing just um, in from that red box to the left hand side of it. Um, and you're actually the the ultrasound is travelling straight through the lung and and to show the heart, whereas normally it'll bounce off the surface and we'll see nothing past the surface of the lung. We, I always have to take care with differential diagnosis. And for me, over the years, it, it has been the work of the postmortem and the work of, for me, doing so, so many scans that I've developed it to try and make sure that I'm uh, not misinterpreting uh, scans. And yet you can have things like lungworm or more commonly what we have is atypical pneumonia uh, caused by mycoplasma. That's a coughing pneumonia, so very often associated with coughing nose. Um, and we can move on to the, yeah, we're just, we're just going to show now, folks, these. Um, this is a slide that was taken, or photographs that were taken last year. Um, and just to be aware that they are uh, really uh, fairly straightforward. So just uh, these are the, the lungs of, of uh, one of Peter and Carl Joe's that was euthanized um, for that. So, Patrick, maybe you want to? Yeah. Put, put so, so we can see there probably on your, your, your fully formed lungs there in the top right and the bottom left, where we're seeing the, the nicer light pink area. Um, towards that's the, the top of the lungs, so up along the spine where it would be sitting. Uh, and then we're seeing the low part of the lungs um, sitting down and they're a darker, a dark pink, a dark sort of gray area. And that's consolidated tumor in that. Now the trachea has also been opened there. It's been split along and we can see some fluid developing. All right, so fluid is very often associated with uh, the disease because the, the tumor takes place in what we call type two pneumocytes, which is a certain cell 
um, within the lung that produces uh, fluid. So you get an increase in uh, production of this fluid. And in some cases, that's why we'll get this, uh, the wheelbarrow test is maybe may called where whenever we pick them up by the back legs, we can get uh, fluid coming out the nostrils. Um, which we're seeing in that bottom right hand side, this this over over overproduction of fluid. Now, the if we're getting this fluid whenever we're picking them up by the back legs in a live view, and you're putting the head down, you're getting fluid out the nostrils. It's a pathognomonic symptom, which means there is no other disease that it can be. So, if we're seeing the fluid, it's a diagnosis of OPA. All right. From that perspective. I have to warn that it's not a brilliant test either, because say I had three U's with two thirds of their lung tumor, so far more even than in this picture, two thirds of their lung completely tumor, and I picked up the three U's by the back legs and I held their, their head down to the ground. Only one of them may be positive on the on the wheelbarrow test. So again, that's why that's not the, the pick of the test, because it's not going to pick them up early. And, and of course, we we want to pick them up early, and it's not even going to pick them up late a lot of the time. So this is the other thing that we can also pick up is uh, is abscesses, and as I showed earlier, the pleurisy as well. Abscesses are actually quite common in sheep in the lungs. You know, it can be caused by previous bacterial infections, and um, maybe the ewes run down. She has another problem where we can get a, a localized abscess in the lung. Um, now, if it's just an abscess, I can I mark her with an A, and we can put her in a treatment and. and the A's and the P's, which are the abscess and pleurisy, if they're if it's economically viable to treat these use, we will put them on a course of antibiotic that could last a month or six weeks. A, a simple jag of antibiotics is not enough for these sorts of sheep. So, um, if it if it's viable to do so, we treat them, and if not, then we we'll call them as well. Um, if there's extensive consolidated areas involved, so like the picture on the on the right and the and the associated uh, ultrasound on the bottom right. We're seeing small abscesses, but we're seeing consolidated areas around it where there's a where there's no uh, there's no air in the lungs. So more than likely, it, OPA could be involved in that lesion, um, and we we'll mark that as a positive and get rid of it. The first thing, and and I've been at the OPA and I've I've preached for a long time, and it's great to be it, it's great to be on this forum and it's great to be talking to people about it because for a long time this disease has been. Uh, in Ireland, this is not a very recent disease. Um, if I associate back, I, I remember you always maybe travelling up the road, um, a couple of miles walk, and you'll find one lay down at the side of the road and be panting and lifted into the back of the the the, the van and taken on a, on home. Or even starting out as a vet, a lot more yews coming in and being treated for pneumonia and maybe a lack of understanding from. A perspective we didn't associate enough OPA in Northern Ireland. So it's great then to finally, first of all, get their diagnosis correct. And um, so people are getting a diagnosed now. We're looking for it. We're not, a, if we're seeing dead use, we're trying to think, could this be an issue? And now we're getting conversations about it. And two to three years ago, the conversation would have been, I don't have it, or it's not, I don't, I don't want it. And it's great now where we're in certain situations and I go to the march and I talk to pedigree men, I talk to commercial men, and they're all more willing to be open and open and honest. Um, because in my humble opinion, the majority of sheep flocks in Northern Ireland are going to be positive for this disease. Particularly if you are buying in a lot of sheep, particularly if you're not double fenced, if you're uh, running with other sheep and common grazing. Uh, you're more than likely going to have this disease or have had it. So it's great to have these honest conversations. So people will first phone me and they'll talk about OPA. Well, for, for, for me, I want them to get the diagnosis. And as soon as I have a diagnosis, then, well, then I'll say, right, you have OPA, let's go and try and scan it. Now, some people say, well, I want to scan a small amount of the flock and see. From my perspective, that is, is no use because to diagnose something in a small amount, these sheep, a lot of the time do not show symptoms until the very end where their lungs are well developed. The lung tumors, they can be producing a lot of fluid. They can be, sorry, a lot of, you know, and infecting a lot of sheep around them at that stage. So we're wanting to pick them up very quickly. And to do that, we're going to have to look at a whole flock scan. And from that perspective, then we find out where the flock sits on the first scan. And then we can start going into your color, your separation or your rescans. 
or there is flux and particularly some of the pedigree end, just like the scan to say, right, we don't have it. And then to maximize then their, um, to keep it, to keep it clean as possible. So looking from the sources when they're buying or trying to keep closed flux. But I will explain that scanning is a hard enough day's work. I generally go with myself. I take uh, another one or two people who work with me, plus the combi clamp, which makes it very handy. But uh, Peter and Carl, uh, of course, and myself, and thanks very much, Shannon, for getting yep. us involved. So at this stage, uh, you, didn't come, you, didn't, you didn't come and help, you know what I mean? I you know, even, if you, even if you had been there. But, uh, I'm sure you're going to show the video now, so uh, we'll see, see what that sort of thing's about. Um, I, even my fashionable uh, fluorescent jacket, which went on. Um, I wish you'd actually heard the thing. So I, I said to the men that uh, we needed some sort of a, a shelter to work in. So we had a hastily erected uh, bit of scaffolding with black plastic um, tied up around it, uh, to which we had to continually tie it on again as it blew off. So as you can see there, the sheep are coming through very quickly. One person on the side of the clamp clamps them half out. Um, and then I've scanned, go around and scan both sides. I have a pair of goggles on and I'm looking into the goggles to, to check and then we move on through. So again, checking, catching them half out of the sheep, lifting the two legs, scanning both sets of lung fields. It used to be that some people would say, why do you only scan one side? Well, we can have a tumour on one side and the other side be completely clear. So we want to diagnose it. And you can see how happy them two men look at stand at the back of, uh, of, the, of the clamp. Um, you can certainly be catching in the pen, but for me, the the the, the speed at which the combi clamp allows us to get through batches of sheep and the ease of which you're doing, because I know previously from catching them in pens, the sweat was lashing off me, never mind the rain lashing off us that day. Um, the one good thing I will say is that at least we were 50 feet back because the, the next 50 foot of lane actually washed away while we were scanning them sheep, which was great too. So um, yeah, it's a simple off premise. For me, it is speed and accuracy are what is important to me and what I've tried to develop over the years of scanning. Um, so I think we're, that's thankfully the visit. You're bringing it back bad memories, so it's it's great to actually not watch that anymore. So, <laughs> well, see, that was just the video. So just basically a couple more, Patrick, and then we'll, we'll be soon be. Listen, so we're going to what do we do next? So I've done, went there, we've done the scan and we've had the conversation. We've had the diagnosis. So how are we going to group them? Well, first of all, we want as many as normal as possible. And oh, I'm going to fall off the seat. So as many as normal as possible. And then we're also then maybe if I'm seeing small marks and small marks are small, small things on the on the lungs that uh, are more, more than likely going to be associated with other pathology, so again, atypical pneumonia, again, some maybe bacterial things, maybe lungworm, I'm going to give them a single dot. And sometimes I will suggest maybe the boys ear notch the, the yos that have had the single dot and just keep an eye on them and say, yo, out of the single dots, maybe it develops more symptoms or if we can, we'll rescan them a wee bit quicker. In general, you know, a lot of the time, the single dots, yes, some of them can be have more, maybe uh, more potential to be positive, but in reality, most of them will become negative, um, and it has just been another issue. The double dots, however, are a wee bit different. They're highly suspicious. So say the lesion isn't as clear for me, it's not a clear tumour, maybe it's more pleural damage, maybe there's a wee bit of abscess associated, maybe there's something else, but for me, I can't say it's definitely a cull, it's definitely an X, but for these double dots, whenever we've done post-mortem work through Greenmount, you know, generally they've been running up around the 50, 60%. So on a commercial basis, we would probably say, right, I am not one to keep two sheep or three sheep if one or two of them has end up going to be positive and, and maintain them in the flock. I'd rather try and cut my losses, get rid of them and try and clear out as best I can. Maybe in a pedigree sense, we will separate these yews out for the value of the sheep. And we'll we we'll look at a treatment plan and we'll rescan them as quickly as possible. Oh well, not quickly. Maybe two three months later, check how they're improving or if they've got any worse, and then cull them from there. The axes, of course, are whenever I'm getting tumor, I'm getting something with sore, maybe a major abscess or maybe major pleural damage or something that the O isn't going to recover from, and um, we want to get rid of her and off the farm and try and get cull value back from her. Understanding. 
this disease is the important thing and it's great that more and more people understand it. Scanning is a flock management tool. It doesn't, it's not a strip in their scan and the next year you are completely clear. Because the way this disease transmits a lot of the time, it can transmit, yes, through the, sorry, the, the fluid produced by the nose um, and also through the colostrum to lambs, newborn lambs, it can uh, go through milk, you know, things like that. So a lot of the, the, the spread could take place from a mother to their, the neonatal lamb, so that, that early lambs. And that lamb, under the right circumstance, and this is what the, the boys were saying about stress impact and, and why maybe we see more signs of it in hill farms, because uh, animals under more stress are more likely to um, develop the virus. You know, and that's that's what we're seeing with COVID at the minute. You know, and that's that's what we're saying that people under stress or people under more risk will, will develop more symptoms quickly. And it's the same with sheep. So it's understanding then that if we scan this year, a lot of yews maybe have been in, infected already in the previous years, and we're trying to then get as much of the tumour out to stop it spreading any further. We're trying to make sure that the newborn lambs every year is going to be as clean as possible. And then over a few years, we're going to try and take out any more yews that are developing symptoms. And that's where we see the scan particularly in Greenmount, where we're, for the first couple of years, well, it was every six months there, just a, and then if it went over a year, over about two, three years there we were at it, where it took a gradual decrease and then a quick drop off. Because from a management point of view, for me, the most important group is the is, is looking after your newborn lambs and also then once we're at age group management so trying to keep your your females um separate from ewe lambs and into hogs or as quick as long as you possibly can and that doesn't suit every system because every system is very different in in how they run sheep the cost benefit calculation the boys give you some there the, the quick one for me is listen the average price could be say for scanning could be around two pound um, it reduces certainly for larger lo larger numbers um but say we the average flock may be running a problem could be at four percent so if we have if we scan 100 euros even at two pounds 200 pounds if we take four euros out that are going to die on you because they will then four euros and the call value even say of a an average you could be around the 50 pound mark so you know, some of them, I, I called yews at 120 pounds at one stage this year, it was great money for them, but um, that can vary in years. But, you know, you have a, if you have an issue, getting the call, call value out of the yews will not only pay for your yews, and then the development of the, the less problems in your flock. Differential diagnosis is quite important, sorry. Um, the differential diagnosis, we'll have to be very, very careful of buying in stock and buying in maybe gimmers and things where we're getting a lot of um, atypical pneumonia. And I, I do find in the last few years, we've we've found this uh, mycoplasma in particular spread more among the, the sheep. Uh, it's becoming more of an issue where we're, we're finding cough and yews. Uh, Longhorn for me isn't really, I scan thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of yews. Longhorn isn't as much of an issue. I know people associating the say cough and yews, I need a dose and no. Um, most of the time it's a bacterial thing, but the lesion can be quite similar to an early Yexicti lesion. So I, whenever I'm talking to a flock owner, I will discuss it with them. I'll see where their recent problems have been. And then uh, my scan will, will, will change slightly accordingly to where they've stood. And the approach to newly purchased sheep. So people will say, right, we're scanning, where do we buy from? Nobody else is scanning. Well, I do see a slight sea change. I see more people, um, going to sales and saying they're scanning their flocks beforehand. Scanning seal, seal animals beforehand, yes, it's nice to know they're not coming in positive. Um, very often the seal animals are very well looked after and even if they have been infected a lot of the time, maybe they're not going to show symptoms until they're put under stress and then they could show symptoms six months after you bought them. For me, it's more important to look at flocks who have been flock scanning. I think it's, it's really really important that we start looking and saying right that flock is scanning that's he's making an effort she's making an effort and i know then if i'm going to be buying uh, animals off them at least yes it's uh we're, we're going to purchase with acceptable risk you know um it's a nation nationwide issue it's across the country it's across to the bottom of ireland it's all over the uk it's all over the north 
the only uh, one of the only places that doesn't have Yaxiki is Iceland, and that's because whenever Iceland diagnosed it, I don't know, 80 years ago or whatever, they decided to call half the sheep on the island. Because they just call every sheep on that section of the island and don't, don't let them to import from there. So that's why they're, they've done it. Of course, we can't do that or else we wouldn't have a sheep left. Um, diagnosis is key. So if you're going to have a conversation about scanning, please get a diagnosis first. Get your vet out, see if you'd stick a scanner on, check if you're getting a, a wheelbarrow test and you're seeing a positive. Um, and look for simple controls, control strategies. So age group management for me is very, very important. Try and keep your female separate as far into whenever they're lambing down as gamers, even further if you can. But again, I'm giving you a gold standard and I know people will be in silver, will be in bronze standard. So do the best you can. Be careful of the sick yos. If you think the sick yos, get her out immediately, get her diagnosed Im immediately. Because say we have a, a yo producing a lot of fluid and you have a lick bucket and a field and she or a, a water trough, of course, that's where she's going to stand and that's where the fluid's going to go. And then the next one comes and, and eats out of the same place. So the risk is in, in the housing too. And just if you're purchasing, remember, it's very hard to say I'm going to purchase from someone who's completely negative. I'm going to purchase with acceptable risk. And that's the best I can say to you. All right. Um, Patrick, brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> You've done well. You've done well. Have we rest? Patrick, Good thank one. you very much. Um, folks, we're just about finished here now. Uh, just one point of what we make now. Patrick obviously has been doing OPA scan for a long time and has become very um, experienced in it. Uh, but he has mentioned there, you know, you know, go to your own vet. First of all, they may or may not offer that service. So, you know, we're not can't advertise anybody here, but obviously just check with your own vet first. If you are have that conversation, as Patrick has said, is there an issue there? Keep the records and then see if they offer the, if they if they do that uh, the OPA scanning as well as Patrick has mentioned. So basically, folks, this we're going to finish up here now um, with some take home messages. As I say, these uh, are applicable to any. Um, disease or any issue uh, on the farm to, to, to do with flock health. Um, and the, the, the card and Peter would be very much um, with this. If you have problems or if you think there's something wrong, don't say, oh, that's just the way it is. That's that type of yo. That's what they do. That's all I'm going to get out of them. No, you have to look at it, um, go to it, keep records. Doesn't matter whether it's paper or electronic. And I think with, with, when we spoke with Clement Lynch the last time, and uh, he mentioned like with his vet, uh, Des Fitzgibbon, that that was one of the biggest advantages that Des had when Clement came to him, that he had figures and he had to say, well, they're, they're doing the X, Y, and Z. So that's a big, big issue with that. Um, as, as, as Patrick has said, you know, speak to your vet, you know, that's the first part of the call. Um, whether you have a, an animal health plan or not, but I would strongly encourage you to have something, act on it, keep it up to date, and do something with it. You know, we've also we've other things there as well. Again, obviously we're talking about OPA tonight, but things like antimicrobial and antimicrobial resistance, they are all the big big issues um, in the sheep industry, and it's something definitely we need to be very much aware of. Again, just to reiterate, Patrick has said, no matter in relation to OPA or any disease, you know, have good quarantine protocols, you know, uh, test the sheep, you know, do the quarantine, give the the, the, the correct antimicrobial group four or whatever it is, you know, the, in, in conjunction with your vet. And then finally, boys, the last point, and I'll be left to Peter and Carl, I just want to mention this last one and your experiences of it. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I would uh, strongly advise even sit down with a vet if, uh, and up uh, some kind of animal health plan and certainly definitely uh, scan your eyes for OPA. Like one thing we found out last year there that uh, it doesn't matter what breed or what age they are, every eye will have it or every eye is a uh, possibility of getting it there now. And uh, once once you see the actual physical signs of it, it's too late that she could have done more damage and spread it around the rest of the eyes there now. So uh, scan the eyes and get them out of the flock as quick as you can. And that'll hopefully pay dividends in the future. Excellent, exactly. Because you say like it's 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 costing you money by doing nothing, you know. So um, definitely, definitely. Right, folks, thank you very much. Um, that's our wee bit for now. Um, so I'll <laughs> back, hand back over to Graham and say thank you very much to Patrick and all. And uh, say if you have any questions. So back to you, Graham.
Okay, thanks very much, Senan. Uh, thanks to Senan, uh, Peter and Carl uh, for delivering an excellent overview. Also, thanks to Patrick for an excellent presentation and for giving up your free time. We do know this is your uh, exceptionally busy time of the year and we do appreciate you uh, doing this uh, for us tonight. Looking at that video, Patrick, uh, it's a day I don't think you'll forget it, the McCacken brothers. Uh, that must have been the worst day of this year, but uh, Hopefully, if you, when you're back next year, there'll be a new shed or something for you, uh, or a canopy over that handling pen. But anyway, thank you very much again, uh, Patrick, uh, for doing that. Folks, as you have been presenting, we have uh, a number of questions have come in here. I'm conscious we're running a wee bit over time, but there's a lot of interest in this here. And if you're all happy, we'll spend another 10 or 15 minutes uh, and just uh, run through a number of the questions. Darren Carty from The Journal has also just joined us there. So, Darren, you're very welcome. Uh, okay. And uh, thanks for joining us. So, I don't want to hold up here. Senan, uh, a question for yourself. Uh, is there much of an awareness throughout the Northern Iron Sheep industry in relation to OPA? Well, obviously, the programme farmers uh, know about it. Um, I know Patrick maybe has answered a bit there. You know, it's, it's becoming better. Um, but I still think there's a fair knowledge gap that we that these type of programs and the farmers that are in it do to spread the word so to speak and to you know don't accept um per performance there's still work to be done still work to be done and i think it is something that we want to try to highlight as much as we can mm -hmm. yeah and saying we've all heard and i've heard conversations with people saying the opa is really an upland no. uh, or health lock no. issue that's certainly not the case what have you found amongst the other program farmers who have you've tested it is in all flocks uh, to more or less degrees, um, it has in the lowland flocks, it's in the upland flocks, and it's in the hill flocks. So that goes out the window. No, it is there. And as Patrick said, every flock has likely got it. So there's no point in ignoring it. Yeah, uh, certainly, certainly not. Uh, there's a question that's come in, Patrick, and you might be best to answer this in relation to post-mortem screening uh, at the, in the meat plant. Uh, is that possible in order to get feedback back to the farmers for supplying yields into into a meat plant? I think that, that that would be to do with the the meat plant. A lot of the meat inspectors have very very little time. Whenever they're uh, on a line, the, the the sheep can be going past that quickly and in such numbers that certainly you would probably need more staff and actually look for that in particular because they are just looking for lung lesions so potentially if we're just recording lung lesions and and aged joes um that could of course be a a way of looking at it but from my perspective that's very hard to do on a line if you've if you've been in an abattoir you know and, and the speed at which then people have to think yeah, and and certainly the current COVID situation doesn't help either. So, uh, so thanks for that, Patrick, uh, Peter, and Carl. Whoever wants to answer this, a couple of questions can, has come in with a lot of interest about your Cambridge ram. What breeding is in that ram? Can you, some of you, please give us a bit of a background too. We need to unmute. Yep. Uh, okay. To be honest, Graham. Uh, I know it's a composite breed, maybe Senan might be fit to tell you better. Uh, as far as I know, he's made up of three different breeds, but what those three are, I uh, just don't know. But we, uh, it was through the business development groups that I uh, heard tell of this Cambridge Ram, that there was one fella, he was saying that uh, he's gone to Cambridge in his flock and he was for getting rid of one of them. And he told me the maternal value on him was uh, 2.8. So I decided that I would take a chance on them and buy them and hopefully in, increase the numbers. But as regards to as what his uh, genetic makeup is, I, uh, to be honest, I don't know. Okay, no, no, no problem at all. We can, we can find that out. Uh, folks, just uh, in relation to the OPA, did you suspect you had OPA in your flock? Uh, or, and what made you decide to go down the test route? Yeah, we, um, we, we suspected, I suppose there was a lot of talk about it and, um, We'd noticed Joe's been uh, slow, especially whenever they come against the hill. And um, just more, more so for peace of mind, we decided we would uh, we would scan to see. And, and then at least we know, I suppose the only thing worse than known is not known. And uh, we uh, we started just, just to investigate to see where we were at. And, and that's that's why we did it, yeah. Yeah, and, and to carry out the post-mortem on the scanning day also just give you reassurance to you. Uh... Carl, you know, so, uh, that's right. I got as got as a sort of visual of it too, and uh, that was it was it was quite interesting to see it too. Yeah, and and you know, you're fifty. You see a fifty percent reduction this year. You know, so are you seeing it now within the flock? Does the flock look any different? Does it look healthier, or now that you've 
Yeah, well, we've noticed um, Yoi's movie. Yoi's would hold their condition slightly better mm. um, as well. Um, they wouldn't be. Uh, they wouldn't just. The condition wouldn't drop off them as quick. And yeah. uh, that was. We've noticed that about them too, and they just seem a bit healthier. Yeah. Yeah, and from the financial end, with more arms on the ground, we, we we covered that earlier on. You know, that's that's a huge benefit too. Uh, that's right. Okay, Patrick, uh, a couple of questions here for yourself. Uh, a farmer has mentioned that he has noticed a lot of coughing, particularly when the sheep are housed uh, late autumn into the winter time through the whole house. Is that a sign of OPA? Coughing, yeah, it can be associated with it. Certainly, in reality, if we're hearing more flat coughing, some people have uh, I've, I've spoke to you about OPA and they say, "Well, I'm calling every time I hear you cough, and immediately calling her." But uh, very harsh in reality more than likely with coughing it's associated with uh, mycoplasma or another bacterial infection and um, whenever we're seeing it in the house it's it, a lot of the time it can be ventilation and um, so say people fattening lambs the ventilation in a, in a closed house you'll start to see more coughing and it's more associated then with bacterial or viral thing other viral things and we'll have to be very mindful to not call just on the basis of a cough you know we, we need more than a diagnosis than that would be my would be my indication and if we're having a lot of problems we could certainly look at a antibiotic treatment or change in the ventilation you know where i have went in and, and, and changed things in the house for people yep and can fertility be affected um it can in reality it doesn't maybe just generally affect it these sheep can be harbingers of other problems and certainly on a lot of flocks, they find maybe the, the following year we're finding reductions in other disease because these the, these yews are under more stress. They have the cancer. They can, they're can they more likely to carry other diseases. And in fact, most of the time, they're more likely to die of something else um, than OPA. You know, we're getting more pastoralist things like that. But uh, fertility is not always completely associated with it. But what you do find is the following lambing period after scanning, most people say is a lot easier um, because these these shows are out of the shed first and foremost, and they're also not um, carrying in other problems. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, totally agree, Patrick. And another a question here in relation to ewe lambs. Should ewe lambs be scanned uh, November, December time? What's your thoughts now? For, for, for me, no, I, I generally don't suggest scanning ewe lambs. Um, too early. I well, of course, if we are going in and we scan the the adult portion of the flock where the disease is more prevalent, so I would suggest we scan the adult portion of the flock more. We'll be coming into looking at mid-pregnancy scanning, which I do a lot of in uh, December, January, February, and even in the March. Um, if the adult portion of the flock is quite bad, then we will, of course, maybe say right, let's look at the ewe lambs. But a, a lot of the time, that younger stock can cause can be carrying a lot of other problems. And we're going to get more chance of misdiagnosis. So very often I will, if I'm going to scan them, I'll scan them maybe on into the new year, maybe uh, in that sort of February time where they're more adult. Uh, you know, they're you know where they're past housing a lot of the stage there, and we'll, we'll look at them. But more into next summer, I, I like doing them as gimmers rather yep. than uh, the new lambs. Yep, certainly good advice. Okay, Darren, just uh, to bring yourself in there, uh, in the south of Ireland, is OPA a big issue or is it becoming more of an issue? What's, what? uh, I suppose, Graham, it, it hasn't been, and it's the same as what uh, what Sinan has said and what Patrick has said, is this, it, it just wasn't diagnosed, it wasn't known. Patrick gave a, a very good talk a few years ago at the Chaga Sheep Conference, and like I think, Patrick, that was one of the most questions you got after was, is that in our flocks? How do we test it? And that was even at a time before you had tested. And like for, for a lot of this, it's it's sort of head in the sand job. This, well, sure, it can't be that because you nearly don't want it to be that. And sometimes it's better to think it's something else rather than be faced up with the suit of it. Uh, the, the Chagas Better Farm Sheep Program have also been doing a bit of say, looking at that, and I know Patrick has been down scanning on some of them hill flocks that, that it has sort of, we've seen it more so on hill flocks. I do agree that it probably is in lowland flocks as well, yeah. but it, it seemed to have maybe spread, or maybe it's a fact that them sheep are probably under more stress than anything else, but uh, no, it is, it, it, it certainly is. Just, Graham, I just, your earlier question on the Cambridge, uh, I had to think back to, to, to use it times we had a professor there, Frank Crosby, who had some of them, and uh, 
he said that uh, their, their their background was probably one of the most prolific sheep alive was a Finnish land race, but probably one of the worst sheep as well by Merosoft. It was all five, six, sevens in regards litter size. Uh, but it was crossed with a few different breeds in, uh, say, Welsh breeds. There was Clint, there was Kerry Hill, there was a few other breeds. And Chagas have done a good bit of work on the gene. It's a similar gene to the Belclare breed. Now, I'd know no more than that, but uh, yeah. that's the, the, where the numbers come from is the Finnish land race. Yeah, no, 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 thanks uh, on that, Dara. That's a question just came in uh, about a couple of cents that in relation to that Cambridge Ram. So, no, thank you very much for, for clearing that. Uh, another, uh, that seems to be the most of the OPA questions. Peter and Carl, a couple of other questions here just in relation to your uh, enterprise. We're now at the, getting close to tipping time. Uh, do you use teaser Rams at all? Um, no, Graham, we don't. Um, uh, just purely, we would be late late ish lambing. Um I suppose most of the yows would have already sort of gone past the first cycle before the tops would go out. Um we find that they would lamb very quick. And I mean like we could have maybe 40, 40 50 yows lambing in a day. And uh, to be honest that's enough. Um so I don't want them coming any quicker. But um but no we we've generally like three weeks puts most of the lambing by. Yep. Uh, and another, yep. No. Very, very good. Another question here. You mentioned uh, you've started weighing lambs more this year than other years. Uh, you have seen the benefits from doing that. That's right. Uh, you can see even even just uh, to pick up um, uh, like health problems, like like worming. Maybe is is, is there a need for worming? And uh, see the the drop off in the daily life weight gains and things like that. Um, it's sort of a precursor to 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 the dung sampling. Yep. Uh, those those and you have been involved with the. Uh, the fact pack system uh, race with them. So. that's right yeah we would we have used that through the um through the bdg, BDG yeah, uh, yeah. as well and uh, it actually picked up that one of the wormers weren't working as effectively as it should have been and uh yeah. we are correct it uh, a lot quicker yeah oh no good good job uh, it's an excellent piece of technology so uh, one final question folks you talked there. You're in the EFS Environmental Pharma Scheme wider scheme, and you're uh, you've submitted your application for the higher scheme. Are you seeing benefits? You're in the scheme over a couple of years now. Uh, what are the benefits are you seeing? Well, I suppose we well, the, <clears throat> we joined the the wider um, in last year. Would have been the first year, and it's so. Um, I know we've um, like as, as I say we we needed more shelter around some of the fields. Um, so that was that was a way of getting getting shelter in, and uh, I suppose we looked at those schemes too. Uh, we looked at what needed done, and then we looked at the schemes and see if we could make the scheme fit for what we needed done as well, um, rather than, than than chasing chasing the scheme to to you know just for, for 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 joining it. So we tried try to make it work for us, you know, as well. Yeah, and when I, you showed us the photographs there, of the hedge hedge plant like it's a biodiversity corridor. It's a right, wild, yeah. wild, you know, own shelter for yews and lambs, so certainly uh, they will do a great job for you. So, uh, mm -hmm. Folks, thank you very much. Now, Darren, a question that came in the last time and we didn't get around, we got cut off to ask him. Breeding stock prices this year have been exceptionally high, have been very high and continue to be high. This question now, it's up to you, Darren, we answer this. Are we paying too much for breeding stock? It's a question that's come in and uh, it was missed the last time and it's back in again tonight. So can you give a, a, a few words on that in relation to breeding stock prices? I look at Graham, it's a very relevant question. Go down to March, the same thing as well. You hear the, the people who are buying are saying that they're mad money people are selling are saying they're not the year enough. Uh, <laughs> I, look, I suppose uh, it, all, it all boils down to the system. What I'd say at the moment is this. Your, your lambs could possibly be a uh, class as being too expensive if they haven't been utilised. And what I mean by that is that paying 150 or 160 euros or maybe 130, 140 pounds for your lamb and not putting them to the ram in the first year, holding them over as hoggets, they come in as a lot higher replacement rate. Now, look, at there's people doing that. They're in a dry hogger system. They're selling them again, and they're happy enough, and they're they're turning a few pounds at it. But if you're in a system, a self-contained, or, a, say, a, a lambing system, as most uh, farmers are, you want to be trying to reduce your replacement rate cost. Like, the, the increase in hogger prices, while it is, say, higher, it's probably not gone over and above what, say, lamb prices have gone. That if you were to take or the extra money that you've got in for your lambs, take the 
your replacement rate is going to be lower, you can justify giving a bit extra in a year for Hoggets. And I think the one area that where we often probably don't pay enough for and we often classify as being too expensive when it probably isn't is our RAM because they have to flock and we often uh, crib about paying maybe 300, 400, 500 pounds uh, given the increase in genetics that we can get. But look, yeah. it all goes back to your system. I think the one good thing, whether prices be good or bad, is it has brought back more confidence and more younger people into sales, which I think is great. Yeah, no, no, very much so, and uh, that is very noticeable this year. There's a lot more younger people into sales, which which is fantastic to see for the industry. Uh, yeah. no, no, certainly. Darren, thank you very much for that. Folks, I am very conscious it's now just past nine o'clock, uh, and... I just want to conclude uh, with a, a few points here. So uh, I hope everyone has found this event useful tonight and that you have now a greater insight into OPA. Uh, if you are a business development group member and you want further advice, speak to your advisor, your local McCaffrey advisor. Uh, and if you have any queries in relation to the programme, certainly get in touch with either myself, Senan or Darn. Uh, or if you have any questions you want to speak to some of us in relation to OPA, certainly feel free to do so. Uh, please note we have another event, a sheep programme event planned for mid-November and further details will be available in the near future. Just to make you aware, tomorrow night we are having our first Caffrey Chuckas Webex event uh, at 7.30 p.m. This is the first of two joint events which will focus on dairy beef production. Uh, tomorrow night's event is going to focus on the early stages of calf rearing management. And if you're interested in joining, please log into the calf rear website and go to the events section and you will get all the login details. So that's tomorrow night at 7.30 and there will be a second event next Thursday night uh, at the same time and it will focus more on finishing dairy, beef, uh, animals, and focus on grassland management. Okay. Uh, finally, I want to thank everybody once again. It has been a fantastic event. Technology hasn't let us down. Uh, panel, uh, fantastic panel, great presentations, great videos, uh, and I thank you all for that. As I mentioned earlier on, we have a short survey, and we would ask that you do complete that. That gives us a, a few ideas of how we need to improve. But all you need to do is hold on once we finish here. Don't shut down, and the survey will come up automatically on your screen. And if you could complete that as honestly as you can, we would appreciate that. So we look forward uh, to our next sheep program event in mid-November. And as I said, we will be sending through further details uh, in the near future. Okay, thanks again for listening. Thank you. Good night.